So it's my great pleasure to welcome one of our esteemed um, leaders in the Foreign Service Corps for the U.S. government. Um, Ambassador Joe Sullivan has seen the world and um, he will share with you his insights from many of his postings. But I think one of the most important things to take away today is to remember that diplomacy is one of the major tools of national security. And when you listen to Joe, think about, um, look through his eyes at the circumstances that may not have seemed the same from here and from our vantage point. So I, I welcome you to travel around the world with Joe. Um, please remember questions on cards anytime. They will be collected. Skip's in the back of the room. He'll collect them for you. And they will be, so you can get your questions in early if you have any. Um, Ambassador Sullivan, thank you very much for being here, and we will look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you, Mari. Because my first three assignments, Veracruz, Mexico, Kampala, Uganda, and Luanda, Angola, the first time, they closed the post before I got there. <laughs> But, you know, everything works out in the end, and I wound up in Mexico City, Washington, and uh, Lisbon, Portugal, so it was okay. So I have learned to adjust, and uh, I uh, had a great career that I was, could not have been happier doing anything else with the 38 years that I spent in the Foreign Service. Uh, I wanted to, I'm going to talk... I think there's probably one or two military or ex-military in the room. Are there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I thought Just I should. Yeah, yeah. So I thought I should touch on that. Uh, I'm going to make it clear that I regard, as Maureen said, diplomacy just like military power or economic strength as just one of the means to protect our country and advance U.S. national interests. As a foreign service officer and an ambassador, uh, I rec recognize that the U.S. military has unique strengths and capabilities and that the U.S. is best served uh, when our military power and our diplomacy work together to advance U.S. interests. I found that our armed forces were always capable of carrying out difficult missions as long as our objectives were clear and achievable. Sometimes the diplomatic task was to avoid the need to use military force. Other times it was to use the least amount of military force and expend the uh, least amount of money possible to achieve our objectives. And at other times, such as in the Panamanian Just Cause operation, it was to work closely with U.S. military command as we took that country for a brief period and restored democracy to the country and ousted Manuel Noriega from power. And since all of our armed operations should come to an end, the greatest challenge is often to find a way to end the conflict and extract American forces without losing whatever gains have been achieved. There are hundreds of problems around the world. We really cannot fix them all with military power or with diplomacy. In some cases, the best that we can do is uh, to advance our interests, is to advance our interest and improve the situation on the ground and avoid the loss of American lives and treasure. Today I'm going to focus on the places that I know best, Mexico, post-revolution Portugal, Israel, and South Lebanon, Central America in its civil wars, Angola, and its civil war, and Zimbabwe, as President Robert Mugabe took his country from prosperity and civility to a despotic basket case. When I began my foreign service career in Mexico City in the early 1970s, alongside Nevada's own Guy Farmer, uh, Mexico was an overwhelmingly poor country, dominated by a corrupt political system built on the lie of institutionalized revolution. 
with no effective political participation for the vast majority of its citizens. The Mexican government maintained the illusion of a revolutionary anti-American foreign policy in order to help justify its corrupt and autocratic domination of its citizens and its minimal efforts to advance the welfare of most Mexicans. Had Mexico remained the same, the contrast of a mostly poor Mexico with an increasingly prosperous United States would have led to huge problems of disparity and migration. The Mexico of today is vastly different from the Mexico I knew in the 1970s. It is a middle-income country with middle-income citizens, most of whom are content to live in their own country amidst their own family members and with improving economic prospects and a genuine opportunity now to choose their political leaders. Mexico still has many problems. Violence, gangs, drugs, corruption, slow economic growth, but its citizens have voted to change their political leaders in hopes of addressing these problems. Mexicans changed their political system in the 1990s to make it far more democratic. Even though the U.S. lost a familiar relationship with the previous Mexican political power structure. In Israel and the Levant, I was deeply immersed for about five years in the mid-1980s and then again in the late 1980s. The Israel of those years was rather evenly divided between labor and Likud parties, and uh, there was actually a, a shared government between. Uh, we sought during that period under the leadership of Secretary George Schultz to promote a peace process. It was rejected both by Palestinian leadership, but also by the Israeli government. Uh, my strongest recollection in those years is of Yitzhak Rabin, then defense minister, saying that he neither liked nor trusted the Palestinian leadership but believed that he could only make peace with enemies and that both sides needed to make concessions to achieve peace and that the alternative to peace, Israel ruling by force over a majority of Palestinians west of the Jordan River, a demographic reality that is rapidly coming into view, would be incompatible with Israel's democracy. <laughs> The U.S. subsequent to that made numerous other efforts to achieve peace, but failed due to both the inflexibility of Palestinian leadership and I would say the uh, ambivalence of the Israeli government about whether or not and to make concessions to achieve peace with Palestinians. The Israel of today is far more prosperous and far more secure than it was in the 1980s and 90s, but it still faced the theoretical strategic threat of Iraq and Syria collaborating to its northeast. My fear is that the current Israeli leadership underestimates the looming problem of ruling over a majority of Palestinians west of the River Jordan and shows no urgency in dealing with that problem. Just as in the 1980s, there's little the U.S. can do to solve the problem without the cooperation of both sides, but we ought not imagine that peace between Israel and the Palestinians is a real estate deal that can be resolved with money or land. On Central America, I worked from 1988 to 1992. I had been familiar with Central America from previous Washington tours when a courageous officer in our embassy in Nicaragua had urged in a dissent message that the United States act to prevent Nicaraguan strongman Anastasio Somoza from taking advantage of the 1972 earthquake to increase his political and economic domination of the country. Advice not taken. The U.S. was too busy in other issues, and we chose not to use the leverage that we had. And by the time I arrived, 
uh, dealing with the region in 1988, we were well into a series of civil wars in El Salvador and Nicaragua, which also provoked a deeply polarized debate in Washington over the U.S. role in these conflicts. Congress had prevented the administration from providing further support to the Nicaraguan Contras, and again, about his own Ted Morse led the program to provide strictly humanitarian assistance to the Contras, while we sought to promote a solution to those years of conflict. And the incoming uh, administration of George H.W. Bush and Secretary of State James Baker negotiated a bipartisan compromise with the Congress in which the U.S. would work to promote democratic elections in Nicaragua and not seek further military support for the Contras. In the end, opposition candidate Violeta Chamorro prevailed in a sharply contested election. The opposition came to power and the Sandinistas uh, <coughs> resisted yielding the property and the benefits that they had gained. For at least some years through diplomacy, we had helped end a conflict we had previously supported and brought a temporary end to dictatorship. <coughs> The Bush administration also declared itself in favor of peace negotiations to end the civil war in El Salvador and encouraged Salvador and President Cristiani to pursue UN negotiations seriously. The State Department, the Department of Defense, Southern Command, CIA, all worked closely together to improve the Salvadoran military's performance and to bring the FMLN guerrillas to the negotiating table. Our USAID mission undertook a very successful program called Mayors in Action, which demonstrated that government could work together with its own citizens to meet their needs. And the US government basically took advantage of an opportune time, the end of the Soviet uh, Union, among other things, in order to bring together all elements of our own government, and uh, as well, Salvadoran parties, and the, uh, uh, a group of uh, supportive nations, including Mexico, uh, Spain, and uh, Venezuela, in order to uh, result in UN negotiations that led to a peaceful resolution. Many problems, as you know, have reemerged in Nicaragua and El Salvador in recent years, and. Uh, including, again, corruption, violence, gangs. And I don't have any magic solution for those problems, but I would submit that none of those is as threatening to the U.S. as the civil wars of the 1980s. And it, that it is important for us to engage to address and help resolve these problems, which affect us directly or indirectly. I also served in Cuba from 1993 to 1996. We didn't have an embassy then, it was an interest section, and I was head of the interest section. Although as an interest section, we were the second largest diplomatic mission in Cuba, next to the Russians. And uh, but it was an interesting period, a period in which Cuba was at the bottom, what they called the special period. The uh, Soviet subsidy of five billion dollars a year had ended. Uh, electricity was intermittent. Food supply was poor, and uh, there were very few resources in the country. And Cuba probably would have been willing to enter into agreement with the U.S. if the terms previously offered were still available those of ending all Cuban support for Latin American revolutionaries, ending their military involvement in Africa, and uh, but by that point, certainly Cuban American community in Miami had concluded that the end of the Castros was near and the U.S. should insist on a total regime change and uh, total change of system. The Cuban government was not interested in those terms, and uh, therefore there were no substantial improvements in bilateral relations 
for many years to come. In those years, we did institute uh, a number of people-to-people -people programs, working particularly closely with organizations like a very small uh, Lions Club, a very small Mace, uh, Masonic Lodges, Jewish community, various community groups that were not under the control of the government in an effort. We had no illusions that these intensified contract contacts would lead to region regime change, but we felt it important that there be more people-to-people -people contact. And over the years, some of you may have participated in these exchanges visiting Cuba, and certainly I support <coughs> that today as well. We also maintain close contact with Cuba's human rights and opposition activists. I'm going to, and, and as well, the relations between Cuban Americans and Cubans intensified. Cuba is only 90 miles from the United States, and we are condemned to live 90 miles apart. Our peoples have had a long and historic relationship. I think that at some point, the enmity that uh, separates us will dissolve and our peoples will uh, be together in many respects. We share many cultural thing, affinities, including baseball. But uh, it is a, uh, it's a long process, but I think a worthwhile process and one that in the United States will benefit both countries. I'm going to skip over again the more recent developments, which turn the interest section into uh, full-fledged embassies in the Obama administration, and also the recent sonar and or microwave attacks, nobody's quite sure, which affected American diplomats. I'll just answer a few basic questions that I think, uh, and give you my view. Should we have full diplomatic relations with Cuba? Yes, it's in America's interests as well as with, as Cuba's. Should we place? Sorry, should we press Cuba to become democratic and respect human rights? Absolutely, but we should not condition everything else on that. Should we increase our contacts with the Cuban government? Yes, on those issues such as narcotics interdiction and migration where those are in America's interests. Should we encourage pe greater people-to-people -people exchanges? Yes, we should continue to engage, and we should continue to engage intensively with human rights and civic activists in Cuba. I only had the ability to do some of these things while I was in Cuba, and our shrunken U.S. Embassy of today has even less opportunity. I arrived in Angola in 1998, just as the final phase of its 27-year-long civil war was about to restart. And our principal task was supplying humanitarian assistance to the millions of Angolans displaced by war. We did that mostly through the United Nations, the World Food Program, and uh, saved, I'm sure, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of lives overwhelmingly women and children. But we had another dilemma, which was, do we continue? My instructions had been, try to revive the 1994 peace agreement in which both sides had agreed to end the conflict. In fact, the uh, guerrilla leader, Jonas Savimbi and UNITA had taken advantage of that truce peace agreement to rearm, retrain, and were ready to go back to war. So when that war resumed, with rocket shelling of the provincial capitals, many lives lost, uh, certainly the Angolan government, the Angolan president, wasn't willing to listen to advice that they should give peace a chance. They felt their country's future life existence was at stake. And they fought back, they rearmed, and they resisted and they didn't want to hear advice to the contrary. So my task at that point was where do I advise my government? I advised my government that the way, the only real way to defend the peace, a definitive end to that civil war, was to choose a side. And the side 
the, of the guerrillas had broken three peace agreements and was a formula for perpetual war, trying to reach another peace agreement, trying to reach another truce, that we should instead make it clear that while we weren't in love with the Angolan government, the Angolan government was the best opportunity for peace for its citizens and as well in U.S. interests since all of our petroleum uh, rights and uh, uh, drilling was in areas controlled by the government, mostly offshore uh, in Angola. And that's eventually what we did. The war eventually came to an end. Joseph Lincoln was killed in con con combat in 2002, and the war came to a very quick end. Uh, Angola is still a, a sad place. It's uh, not, it, it's very rich in petroleum, but its people are very poor. But uh, at least there is peace. There is finally a new Angolan president who does appear to be at least trying to clean up the corruption that has been endemic in Angola. And the U.S. and other petroleum companies have substantially increased their investment and production from Angola deep and ultra deep waters. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually, because I see our time is running here, skip Zimbabwe, and but be prepared to answer questions, and then I'm gonna move on to the lessons I draw from this from the overall situation, I would say from 38 years of experience, there are both things where we can be effective and places we cannot be effective. There are policies that are effective, policies that are ineffective. The U.S. can be a force for good and for advancing American interests when we utilize all the investments, we, all the instruments we have. Nothing's guaranteed. And there are times when no conceivable policy can achieve our objective, as was the case in Zimbabwe in the years that I was there, and probably in Cuba in the 1990s, once our objective became a total opening of the regime. But there are times when an ideal set of circumstances allows us to achieve our objectives and advance American interests with minimal expenditure of blood and treasure as was the case in post-revolution Portugal and in Central America at the beginning of the 1990s. <coughs> America's decision to help put an end to the war in Central America was very beneficial both to the U.S. and to the region. The execution of U.S. policy required very close coordination among civilian, military, and intelligence arms of the U.S. government as well as both Central American regional governments the UN and the OAS. But sometimes the decisions not taken are just as important as those taken. <coughs> the US decision not to prevent Nicaraguan dictator Somoza from seizing increased political and economic power in 1973 had grave <coughs> consequences for Nicaragua and all of Central America in the 1970s and 80s. I worry today that our lack of engagement on the Israel-Palestinian issues could have severe negative consequences down the road. I believe that American military force is not, nor should it be, the default solution to all problems. We succeed best when we work together and when there's a clear plan for what we intend to achieve, how we will get there, and how we will get out. A few broader conclusions. American global power and influence, I believe, are good for Americans. America is more powerful and prosperous when there are clear rules and we are the ones who help set them. America's power and influence are multiplied when we work with other countries. We need like-minded friends and allies who can assume some of the burdens of global leadership and together solve problems that even the U.S. Can, can't manage alone. An isolated America is a less successful and a less secure America. America is better off having more democracies in the world 
rather than more autocrats and dictators. A world growing in freedom is a world where Americans can advance U.S. interests and enjoy greater peace and prosperity. Americans are richer when America is the world leader in the global economic system. And America's global leadership can only be maintained if the U.S. maintains its diplomatic strength in funding its foreign service, just as it funds its armed forces. And at a time when China's spending on diplomacy has increased by 40% in the last five years, U.S. funding for its core diplomatic functions has fallen by a third. I welcome your questions. When we can get into the specifics of the cases examined, pick up Zimbabwe if you like, deal with uh, any issues you would like to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, um, for your insight. Uh, so why don't you... Well, I'm going to actually pull this back so that people... All right, so we have several questions. I will take more if you, if you have more. Um, but I'm going to start with the topic that you said you weren't going to touch on, of course, <laughs> which is... Now we're not competing, I hope. Okay, so the concept that you didn't touch on Zimbabwe, I'm not, not just going to ask you about the situation in, in Zimbabwe, but are there parallels in your mind between what happened in Zimbabwe then and potentially what's happening in Venezuela now? So, good roll. Two continents sure. and lots of lots of topics all together into one question. Okay, well, I'm not sure if this is going to work. Yeah, you should be on. Are you? Yes. Can you hear? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Zimbabwe. You know. Hold it. Hold it down and close. There. No. No. Put your chin. Eat the mic. Okay. So we're not part of the digital microphone. Now you can hear? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see, the uh, Zimbabwe, just to briefly summarize what I was going to say, at the time I arrived we had a unified policy which was uh, press the Zimbabwean government to hold free and fair elections, be supportive of the opposition and civic activists, and we tried, but Robert Mugabe, president, was not interested. He was going to win the upcoming elections in 2002 by whatever foul means were necessary, and he succeeded. And then he beat the opposition and beat them more and uh, intimidated the opposition and marginalized them. So the bottom line answer of that was, could we have, we continued to support the opposition, we continued to, I went in one time, they tried to uh, try Morgan Shrengarai, the opposition leader for treason. I sort of forced my way into the trial, and there's a photo of me being barred from entry with a police baton, but the fact that we went in they desisted from that trial, at least for trying him for treason, because it was too ugly, too much of a spectacle. They backed off from that, but they certainly were not going to allow him to come to power. So I conclude from all of that that well, the instrument, and we implemented a number of what they call smart sanctions on Zimbabwean leadership. Now it died again. Try the other mic. Okay, yeah. So we used a number of smart sanctions on the leadership, uh, barring them from coming to the U.S., freezing their financial assets, etc. 
But the reality is Zimbabwe is a long way from the U.S. And people had other options, even though we were working together with the European Union, and the European Union implemented a number of those sanctions as well. So my conclusion is we could not achieve our objective of promoting a uh, democratic Zimbabwe, a people in which a prosperous Zimbabwe as well, because the result of Mugabe's eventual policies was to destroy the economy of that country. But uh, we could not achieve our objectives with the policies we were prepared to use. Venezuela is a lot closer, and the Venezuela is a lot more linked with the American financial system, a lot more dependent on uh, particularly in the petroleum sector, its exports uh, on the United States. And because it has become a disaster with three million Venezuelans leaving that country last year, can you imagine? That is a real migration crisis. That's a real migration crisis. And going in mostly to Colombia, but also to Brazil and Ecuador. It is a disaster that the region feels deeply, and that is the reason that the Lima Group, as it's called, of large Latin American countries has come together to recognize the uh, uh, president of the assembly as the actual acting president of Venezuela. So I think it is more possible to achieve an objective of giving Venezuelans their right to have representation, choose their own leadership fairly, not be dictated to by a, a thugs, and uh, also to resume being the prosperous country that it used to be, with all the work that that will take. I think it's important that we not think that military our military and invasion, an American military invasion is the solution. I think there are Latin countries who should be in the lead if any military action is uh, necessary. But the first uh, objective should be supporting those democratic figures in the country, penalizing those autocrats who are uh, impoverishing their country and are, uh, are repressing their people so greatly and that it will take time and it will take patience but uh, it is possible where it was not possible in Zimbabwe. Excellent. Thank you. That was a very thoughtful answer. Um, speaking of time and patience. Um, let's hop back to one of your other favorite venues and um, talk a little bit more about your perspective on the Israeli-Palestinian situation. In particular, you made a comment that the proposals that were on the table when you were there were not necessarily viewed as realistic solutions, um, particularly by the Israeli government. And certainly the position that some but not all Palestinian leaders have taken that um, Israel doesn't have a right to exist, um, is not tenable on the other side. Um, what do we do now to, sh to shorten it up? And what's your thoughts moving forward? Is this an achievable situation to get to peace in the Middle East? A lot more people who've spent a lot more time thinking about peace process than I uh, have not been able to find a solution. I think it's in, I do think, as I said in my presentation, that it's in Israel's interest to achieve a solution. And I'm afraid that the current Israeli leadership is mostly focused now, and frankly over the last 10 years, on winning the next election, and has not looked forward into the future. We cannot force Israel to a, uh, a peace agreement. It's not possible, and that shouldn't be our objective. We can encourage them, we can urge them, and we can uh, 
urge the Palestinians to get their act together in a way that they are a viable partner for peace. But we do need two parties. Unfortunately, I think there are potential negative consequences for the United States if the situation goes unresolved. We become a less credible partner in all of the Middle East, and uh, it does. We have a lot of interests throughout the Middle East, not just in Saudi Arabia, but in many countries in the region. And if uh, Israel-Palestinian con conflict, open conflict, breaks out again, it will never be a strategic threat to Israel. Israel can handle that, as Rabin used to say, as an annoyance, a terrible annoyance, sticks and stones. It's the, now there are small rockets, but they're still annoyances. They are not strategic threats. But even those, uh, the renewal of conflict is damaging to us in the United States to the degree that we are seen as an unquestioning uh, supporter of Israel under all circumstances and no matter, uh, uh, and even in a situation of conflict with their own population. Yeah. A tough one, <laughs> a very tough one. Um, I imagine we'll be having uh, diplomats into the future talking about this situation. So that brings us to a more general question. Uh, we, in, in the National Security Forum, hear uh, numerous presentations from uh, military and former military um, folks who talk about you know, their tactics and their approaches. Um, you talked about regions, you talked about places, um, could you uh, expand more on what are the tools that, that a diplomat has in his or her arsenal? How do they use them in particular circumstances? And what, to what end are they, um, is their goals? Are their goals? I guess just to simplify as much as possible, I'd put it in one word, relationships. We build relationships. <laughs> It's not a business deal, it's a relationship. And particularly in the field, we are building relationships. Relationships with our uh, foreign partners, relationships with the population. Uh, some of it is direct for people to be uh, in, in on an individual basis. Some of it is through the media, but we are building a relationship. And those relationships may not even have an immediate objective on the day you're building that relationship. But three months, six months, a year down the road, it can be very, very valuable. And a relationship means that it's a two-way relationship. Somebody else gets something out of it as well. Sometimes it's just information. You're sharing a little information. They're sharing information with you. Other times it's, uh, uh, we're working out a, uh, a uh, trade agreement. It cannot be benefits for just one country. It has to be benefits for both countries. And then it is my belief that that is, uh, one, it's part of basic economics, but it's also part of diplomacy, that uh, there are win-win situations. There is not a winner and loser, or, or there shouldn't be. The objective should be to have win-win situations, and that's what we strive for. Excellent. So let me pull the thread on that. You build relationships. What happens when there's a major world event that calls into question the foundation of those relationships. And I'll, I'll, I'll cite specifically the fall of the former Soviet Union and the breakup of uh, the Soviet Union. How did that impact, not necessarily diplomacy there, but diplomacy wherever you were in the world? Interesting, in that period, that was the period when I was working on Central America. And we traveled to Moscow. We met with the uh, Russian uh, foreign ministry at a high level. 
and we discussed how we could collaborate and work together to promote peace in Central America. So we sought to take advantage of that. We also sought to take, it, take advantage of it in a positive way, and we were happy. They wanted, among other things, a little bit of credit. So we were happy to put out all kinds of joint statements about how cooperative and uh, uh, cordial the relationship was and how much we were all supporting a, an end to conflict in Central America. And I think as well as they did that, it served our interests much closer to the region in sending the signal to the parties that were engaged in conflict, former allies, if you will, of the Soviet Union, the time had come to end the war and, and uh, come into a peace process and end this conflict. Excellent, thank you. So when you look across diplomacy, like you said, in building relationships, how do you measure success? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the spot to think about big systems. So what does diplomacy look like with say China, which you didn't mention, which has changed a lot over time. Um, what does engagement and diplomacy look like in on the African continent? How do you know that what you're doing is working? And what tools do you use to evaluate that? And how do you look at engagement in those um, two big spheres? We have another hour or so. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'll just, I guess I would only try to answer it by just saying not to try to take snapshots, but to take videos. The uh, uh, relationship, the pluses and minuses, the are, cannot be measured on a given day, but should be uh, measured over time. Success does take time. Loss also takes time, but you should look at it as a video. Less than an hour. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to come back to the South America question because you are. Um, a scholar and have spent much time there. So back to the Venezuela Maduro question that we're dealing with right now. Maduro and Chavez, history in Venezuela. What are we doing, what do we do vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between the United States and Chile when we did engage? And are there lessons to be learned from that, both good and bad, um, to apply to the current situation in Venezuela? Yeah, well, I don't want to go back and do a lot of Chile uh, history with Chile, but the brief summary is, of course, uh, uh, Salvador Allende, a socialist, uh, was elected in a free election, uh, although with less than an absolute majority. He took power, and the country moved leftward. The United States became very alarmed. Chilean military became very alarmed. The Chilean military organized a coup, and we wound up being supportive of the results of that coup. And that military government uh, held power for about 15 years, as I recall, before it transitioned to a, a democratic uh, uh, government once again. I think that there's probably a lot of lessons in there. But I think uh, whether there were other, I think we at that time, and hopefully this is not a relevant lesson today, a lot of our views of much of the world was shaped by a Cold War picture. Everything was either black or white or red or blue. And uh, uh, I think that probably in retrospect, Salvador Allende, there were alarming aspects about his regime and questions about which way he would take the country, but I don't think it was as red as we saw it at that time. Uh, in terms of the military, I think we were undoubtedly too accepting 
of a uh, military coup that may have uh, addressed one of our concerns about the INA regime, but at the same time used uh, brutal force, repression, uh, murders, in order to achieve its objective and eliminate its opposition. And then I would say that in the uh, latter period in the transition, we did play a supportive role. We had changed ourselves. We had decided that it was uh, useful that, uh, and positive that uh, Chile moved back in a democratic direction. And we helped push, probably gently. Maybe we could have pushed harder, but we did push. And uh, so Venezuela today, uh, I think there are real risks in uh, if there is a military outcome to this crisis. A real, a real uh, risk, and if it's perpetrated by Venezuelan military officers saving their country, as they would undoubtedly say, uh, I would hope that there is no American hand behind that. Uh, in terms of transitioning back, I do think basically having supported this young, courageous man the assembly president who's walking the streets openly in peril of his life, uh, having declared himself the acting president, I do think he merits support wherever, in whatever way we can in an effort to proclaim the need to go back to an election framework. And I think the other feature that is different from that of Chile is that this will be an impoverished uh, Venezuela. It will be a basket case that will need every type of human humanitarian support. And so far, all we've announced is, frankly, small potatoes. And we need to be ready to step up with much more than that. And particularly if he is, if a genuine transition begins. Wow. <laughs> So I'm going to let you close with some final thoughts, but um, I'm going to capture what I'd like you to think about is there are lots of movements that happen in the United States. There's a democratic socialism, there's populism, the conservatism, there's lots of isms um, that happen in the United States. How does the impact of this swing of the pendulum of um, uh, American views of itself are uh, reflected in the diplomatic mission and what are your thoughts for the young generation looking forward? Um, what do they have to look forward to, positive and negative, um, in the coming years? So there you go. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> and that's a good place to have concluding thoughts as well. I do think that uh, we are part of the world and we need to relate to other countries and other peoples and those needs are going to uh, increase as years go on. I understand we've had a reaction perhaps to globalism in, our recent, in recent elections, perhaps a question whether we were focusing too much externally and not sufficiently on our own issues. I understand that, but I do think it's important that whatever our own domestic focus is, that there be a recognition as broadly as possible that uh, our interests and global interests are intertwined and we need to find ways to work together with other countries and other people. I must say that even though US, uh, US funding for US diplomacy in relative terms has been shrinking, in part uh, because the security tail, if you will, is growing larger and larger, and the number of people actually out in the field working on political, economic uh, issues is uh, diminishing. Uh, the Congress has been very supportive, and at a time, the first two budgets submitted by the Office of Management and Budget in uh, 2017 and 18 were 
radical cuts, 40% or something. And the Congress essentially restored levels to previous levels. Uh, so we, we are, I think, have some degree of congressional support that I hope, assume, reflects Americans' broader views. Americans have many connections throughout the world, whether they're diplomats or military or whether they're business people. Our, a lot of our trade now is international. A very large number of American jobs are uh, exports. It's uh, and uh, an issue I recall dealing on Haiti at one stage. I didn't mention it, Haiti, I did Haiti for a year. One of the fascinating aspects of Haiti is that many, many church groups are very active in Haiti and providing assistance, providing special programs of assistance, particularly after the 2010 earthquake. So it's, uh, I think we are, uh, I think we all Americans have a much greater uh, involvement with the world than is sometimes recognized, and I urge and encourage that to continue. And uh, that I think American people and the Congress that it elects have the ability to make sure that that remains. Excellent, Joe. Thank you so much for your insightful presentation. Thank you for being here. It was uh, wonderful to share this.